Uh, so this week we are continuing our sermon series going through Jesus' kingdom, his upside down kingdom. And every week we've been alluding to these two, these two different objects up here, these two different types of crowns. And really these have been this consistent image for us of what it is about Jesus' kingdom that's so unique. Because often when we think of kings and kingdoms, power, all these different things, we, we think of something like this. This is a normal kingdom. The kingdoms we're familiar with. But Jesus' representation of his kingdom is a little different. His upside down kingdom. And as we've been going through this series week by week, hopefully you've begun to realize that these two kingdoms could not be more opposite from one another. How they view power, how they, how they our role in them. Man, complete opposites. And so this morning, one of the things we're going to be talking about is, is this topic of expansion and conquest. You know, all the kingdoms throughout history have engaged and had a definition of what it means to expand and, and have conquest. And for many, even saying those words leaves a bad taste in our mouth for good reason. You know, this kingdom right here, countless atrocities, untold numbers of innocent victims have been killed as a result of expansion and conquest. But, but, in Jesus' kingdom, in his upside down kingdom, those words, expansion and conquest, they have an unusual meaning, perhaps an unexpected meaning. Now, uh, perhaps the best way to uh, explain and understand what the words expansion and conquest mean in Jesus' kingdom is to hear examples. Originally, when I outlined this message, <laughs> I put three different passages on your bulletin because um, I wasn't sure which one we were going to look at because each one kind of explains in, in different theological language, in different ways, what it means, Jesus' expansion of his kingdom, conquest in his kingdom. But we didn't use any of those. <laughs> Instead, we're going to look at examples. Examples of, of the kind of expansion and conquest, what it means in this kind of kingdom. Now we're gonna be reading from Acts chapter 26 this morning. If you wanna start turning there. And in Acts chapter 26, the apostle Paul is, is telling his life story, a key story in his life, to a guy named King Agrippa. And now Paul, when he starts his story, and he starts sharing, you know, Paul explains how basically he was an agent of this kind of kingdom. Paul engaged in expansion and conquest, and it looked like this kind of expansion and conquest. So here's an example of what this kind of expansion and conquest looks like. It's verses 9 through 12, we'll read them together. Paul says, I too was convinced that I ought to do all, th all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. So at this point, Paul was, was perhaps one of the greatest enemies of Christianity, especially in the early movements. Paul was an enemy of Jesus. Paul engaged in expansion and conquest against Jesus. And that meant he would hunt down followers of Jesus. He would deceive them, trick them. He'd punish them. He'd persecute them. He'd imprison them. 
and he'd execute them. After all, expansion and conquest involves destroying your enemies. Expansion and conquest involves destroying your enemies, and that's exactly what Paul did. Now, we shouldn't be too surprised by what Paul is saying, right? Because what he's simply describing is the countless atrocities and casualties that have been committed as a result of expansion and conquest, as a result of destroying your enemies. And this kind of expansion and conquest, the one that Paul was just describing, that's the one that leaves a bad taste in your mouth. But, but, if we look at Jesus' kingdom, if we look at this kind of kingdom and how it functions, man, how is this different? How is it opposite? Let's see how Jesus' kingdom engages in expansion and conquest. And so remember verse 11, Paul was talking about how he was so obsessed with persecuting Christians that he would even go out into foreign cities. He would travel all the way outside of his little region to go and persecute and hunt down Christians. So he continues in verse 12 and says, on one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The Lord replied, now get up. And stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what, I have, of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and, place among those, and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So we have, to, we have to recognize what Paul is even describing of himself, right? His own story firsthand that, that Paul was one of the greatest enemies of Christianity. And then in verse 15, we, we hear those words, right? We hear Jesus speaking to Paul and saying, Paul, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Paul was an enemy of Jesus. Paul was an adversary. But after this moment, on the road to Damascus, Paul, the, like the greatest enemy of Christianity, right, goes on to become the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. And not only that, our enemy, Paul, right? Writes like half the New Testament. He, he's, he's writing the books of the Bible. And there's part of us is like, wait, this is pretty confusing, right? What is going on here exactly? Whose team is Paul on again, right? Is Paul our greatest enemy or our greatest ally? Remember, expansion and conquest involves destroying your enemies. And don't you see, that is exactly what Jesus did in this passage. Jesus destroyed his enemy, but he didn't destroy Paul. See, something powerful is happening here, an example in this passage of what expansion and conquest looks like in Jesus' upside-down kingdom, right? Uh, when Jesus encounters his enemy, Paul, we expected, like the thing we were expecting, the thing we would have expected was for Jesus to strike down Paul. 
here's his enemy standing right in front of him. Like, go for it. But instead, Jesus says to Paul, I will rescue you. We expected Jesus to reject Paul at this moment. But then instead, Jesus turns and says, Paul, I'm sending you. I'm choosing you. I want you to be my light in the darkness. And that doesn't make sense until you realize how Jesus defeats his enemies. How he defeats his enemies. And you know, there's, there's part of how he defeats his enemies that should be obvious from his crown. Jesus destroys his enemies by being destroyed on their behalf. Jesus destroys his enemies by being destroyed on their behalf, right? It, Paul has committed atrocities, and that's what he's telling us. And, and Paul deserves to be struck down. He knows it. But it's Jesus who is struck down in Paul's place. So that instead, Jesus can turn to a guy like Paul and say, Paul, I will rescue you. And Paul deserves, rightfully deserves to be rejected, right? But it's Jesus who is rejected in Paul's place. Also that Jesus can say, Paul, I am sending you. Paul, I want to use you. See, while we were still sinners, while we, will, while we were still enemies of Jesus, Christ died for us. Jesus destroys his enemies by being destroyed on their behalf. The man who was once the greatest enemy, the Apostle Paul, wants everyone to know and understand how expansion and conquest work in this kind of upside down kingdom. So Paul tells us, and explains to us in 1 Timothy, he says the following words. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Like, don't argue with me about this. Christ, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. See, Paul wants you to know that his life, this story we just read, he's telling it to us as an example. And Paul says that, that there is no one out there worse than me. <laughs> Paul claims it, right? I am the worst ever. But when Paul encounters Jesus, Jesus says to his enemy, I will rescue you. I will send you. And at that moment, our enemy Paul was destroyed. And we were introduced to our brother Paul. In fact, in Acts chapter 9, if you read through Acts chapter 9, you get to hear this whole story, this encounter, the road to Damascus, in detail. And one of the things that happened right after Paul has this road to Damascus moment, he enters into the city of Damascus, and, and there's this guy in Damascus named Ananias. And Ananias is a, is a Jesus follower, and, and part of the story that we don't always click together and understand is Paul was going to Damascus to go hunt down and destroy guys like Ananias. Maybe Ananias himself. And, and God commands Ananias to go and welcome his new brother, Paul. My brother, Paul. 
See, Paul says that he is an example. His life is an example because this same offer that was made to Paul is made to you. Place your faith in Jesus. Place your trust in Jesus. Place your hope in Jesus. And he will destroy another enemy by being destroyed for you on your behalf. <clears throat> in fact, uh, we have some new brothers and sisters uh, to welcome today uh, into this upside down kingdom. We'll see in a few minutes. Now I know that uh, as we look out into the world, uh, sometimes we can get discouraged. Uh, you turn on the news, you look at articles online, and it appears as if Jesus' followers are losing ground. There are Pew Research statistics, right, uh, that show rapid decreases in Christian faith in the United States. There's all sorts of data and different things out there. And so Christians can be tempted as we think of those words, expansion and conquest, to engage in it like this. To destroy enemies like this. But the power of Jesus' kingdom looks like this. It's when expansion and conquest looks like this. Jesus destroys his enemies by being destroyed on their behalf. You know, I'm reminded of uh, an old roommate I had. Uh, and, and he was an Air Force officer. And uh, as an Air Force officer, a military guy, I remember he would always jokingly say, uh, did you know that you're never actually outnumbered by the enemy? You're simply in a target-rich environment. <laughs> right? <laughs> Something a military guy would definitely say. <laughs> you know, you turn on the news. You look at the statistics. You are in a target-rich environment. Last week, we sent over 50 youth, not even including the leaders, over 50 youth to Winter Blast Camp and last Sunday morning, I shared how, hey, I'm going down, it sounds like we've got a few youth that are going to get baptized. So, headed down to support them. And uh, Pastor Caleb Hamilton, many of you are familiar with, was leading the baptisms that night. Uh, but there was so many getting baptized. Get this. Uh, he needed an entire team of assistants because they were dunking four people at a time. Yeah, pretty incredible. Like, that's a lot of baptism. <laughs> that is a lot of baptisms. Like, baptism on scale, right? But here's the really crazy part. Over half of those baptisms were from our church. Yeah. They were from our youth group. And so we've got a video of that event for you to be able to see and witness up on the screen. So, so check this out. Jesus, be with these students. Holy Spirit, light them up. Lead them, Jesus, into where you are leading them, Lord, in their schools and their hometowns, I pray. Jesus, we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's hear it for the church. We commit these students to you, Jesus, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We baptize them, Jesus. For these ladies who are getting baptized right now, may they never forget this moment. God, would you move in mighty, miraculous ways in their lives? Jesus, we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In obedience and baptism, Jesus, we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus.
Pretty amazing. Yeah. All right. If you got baptized, would you stand up this last weekend? If you got baptized, yeah. Pretty wild what God is doing. Just seeing another example, what does it look like? You know, when baptism, that symbol, when you go down into the water, it's, it's like death. That old person was destroyed. They're placed into the tomb. When they come out of the water, they're being brought up to new life, just like Jesus rose from the dead. And it is pretty wild because, um, you know, we did 13 or so baptisms uh, last Sunday, but there are actually another seven youth that are wanting to get baptized, and even more, I heard after the service, wanting to get baptized uh, just this next month. And they're talking with family. Just incredible. And, and that is a lot of baptisms, right? Like, whoa, that is a lot of baptisms. And uh, maybe some of the things that explain, like, what, that, baptisms? Well, over this fall, we've had uh, 15 youth uh, accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So now you're seeing them take those steps of faith and obedience and declare it publicly. Hey, this is my king. I'm part of this kingdom now. And, and that is amazing, right? Like that was amazing. But there is even more that's happening in the lives of our youth. Things that are hard to capture on a video. Some pretty big moments. And so just like we heard Paul's story, we saw an example through Paul's life of what this kingdom looks like. You're going to hear some more stories. Stories of what this upside down kingdom looks like. So I'm going to invite up Miss Tina and Miss Tricia. They're going to share for us a little bit more. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it amazing to see the joy on those kids' faces? And they're just rejoicing. Even the ones who weren't getting baptized, seeing them just shout for joy when they're watching their friends. They were um, videoing them for them. And so we were very blessed to be there to see these kids just worship, just genuine worship. Um, and I do have to, you know, extend a thank you to um, you know, Bear to the Christian Camp and all the other, uh, you know, Faith E and Harvest. Okay, so they had a choice to cancel or to make it happen, and in three days they made it happen. And the only words I can say is, but God, because if we call it, it was like a retreat, and we have memories ingrained in our hearts forever for it, from it, and these kids are just so special. And if you just get to know them, you're just going to fall in love with them. But so we just wanted to share some of the things that God is doing. You know, I think of the song, um, you know, set a fire in my heart. And uh, the other part is, I want more of you, Lord. And these kids want more. They're not only accepting Christ. They're not only just getting baptized. They're begging for Bible study. On Tuesdays, I always get a, a lot of texts saying, do we have Bible study tonight? Do we have Bible study tonight? Um, the boys are saying, we want to do Bible study. So they want to dig deeper. Um, and we have some kids that are going to school sharing the gospel at lunchtime, at a lunch table, sharing the gospel with their friend. And their friend is receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior at school at the lunch table. And then they come to youth group that night and share so we can all rejoice with them. These kids are getting it. They understand what kingdom growth means. Um, so I do have a lot of people to thank as well. First off, thank you, Holy Spirit, because he's the one doing the work. And we're nothing without him. Um, and I do thank you to all the leaders. There's a list. I can't even name them off because I'll forget. You know who you are. We had like 13 vehicles bus, uh, traveling with kids to get them to camp. Um, I have leaders show up on Wednesdays, leaders show up on Mondays, and I, we couldn't do it without you. So if you're a leader, thank you. Um, the other group of people that don't get recognized are the prayer warriors. Um, we are covered in prayer and we feel it. And I was just talking with Paula last, um, in between services, and um, Lacey Shaw and I have talked, and we're just like, 
we feel a shield of protection over our ministry. There's no words to explain it. And nobody told us they were praying specifically for a shield of protection. But then um, that when I talked with Paula, she said, that's exactly what we've been praying for. So those of you who are praying, thank you for that. Um, just know that your prayers are being answered and they're powerful and they're, they're, nece they're necessary. And we're eternally grateful for your prayers. Uh, and so Trish is going to share. All right. Um, so that was amazing to watch those, um, a repeat of it. And I got to watch it last service too, but um, that pool was cold. Um, <laughs> but uh, I just want, wanted to say that the only way to describe this, the last weekend was um, a revival. And if you've seen Jesus Revolution, uh, the movie, that's exactly what happened. And it's amazing. And I just, um, I'm just in awe of these kids that are just choosing Jesus. Um, some of these kids are coming from broken, broken, broken families that don't even know who Jesus is or have already disclaimed that they don't believe in Jesus. But these kids are stepping into faith. Obviously, being at school and sharing their faith is huge. And um, so I just wanted to say, that there are some amazing things going on in our youth. There's amazing, amazing things going on um, in our kids' ministries. So thank you for praying. Um, I, I am going to have a last uh, service I had just the kids that stood up um, that were, went to Winter Blast. But we have an amazing group of a lot of youth here today. And this is amazing. So I want all of you kids that are in our 7th and 8th, all 6th, 7th, 8th, all through junior high and high school, to stand up. Give him a hand of applause. Yeah. Um, so, what, uh, stand up, keep standing, keep standing. No, no, we're not done with you yet. Um, so, I want you guys to look around this room and see these youth. They are making statements for Jesus. And the only one that we can really praise is Jesus. So thank you. And, um, but I want you guys to know, each, each one of you that is standing up, you've got a target on your back. Not in a bad way, but you've got a target on your back. You claim that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Life gets hard. And the already, I've already known some of your struggles are hard. So don't forget that. Jesus is with you. So let's extend a hand. If you're around a youth kid, please extend a hand on them. We're going to pray for them. Lord, we just thank you for this youth. We thank you for this community. We thank you for this group of believers, Lord. We thank you for um, this church. Uh, Lord, we just pray a hedge of protection over these kids. They've made some huge uh, milestones over the last few months. Um, on Mondays and Wednesdays, and then this last weekend, Lord, and we just thank you for this revolution that's going to sweep over this town. Lord, we know that these kids not only represent um, the youth of the America, but also just their homes, um, and everything trickles back to our house. Um, so, Lord, I just pray that we just, the enemy flee. <laughs> In Jesus' name, Lord, we know that you are good and you are sovereign and you are doing big things in this community. And I can't express how excited I am to see that. But Lord, right now, I just pray for each one of these individuals, Lord, that they have claimed your name. And I just pray that they go out into the schools and again, just be your hands and feet, Lord. Be a light into the darkness, Lord. Be just like Paul was. Lord, doesn't matter what they've done, Lord, you love them. And that goes the same for all of us, Lord. So I thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to have two youth kids come up. All right. I'm going to have Patrick and Easton come on up. Um, so not... And there's nothing better than letting them share their story themselves, right? So if you don't know Patrick, I'm sure you all know. I, I do have to brag on him. Uh, he helps with my middle school youth group. He helps his mom. He is helping everywhere. But um, if he says he's going to do something, he shows up. Those 
uh, middle school boys look up to him. He is a mentor to them, and I just thank you for that. But he's going to share his story. And then Easton Vindiola, if you don't know him, you will fall in love with him the minute he speaks. Uh, he is uh, just charismatic, but he is an evangelist already. Like He just can't keep quiet about what God is doing in his life. So I'm going to pass it on to... Hi, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Patrick. Um, Lacey Shaw, our children's ministry director, is my mom. I grew up here in church. Sometimes we joke that I live here. Sometimes we're not joking. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but because of that, I was baptized when I was seven, you know, grew up in church. And I've had a lot of opportunities over the years to serve in camp ministries, VBS, Wednesday nights, all that. And, um, because of that, I always struggled with what my calling is because I feel like I do so much that God could put me anywhere. I could go wherever he wants me. And I've always had that attitude of where does he want me? And I've prayed over that for the last few years and I felt like I just got radio silence. I got nothing. But this weekend, I went up, and that changed. But I went up this weekend expecting to get to minister to some of these middle school boys, like I always do. Um, Wednesday nights, I get to see them go from coming to youth group for the first time all the way to getting baptized. And that's just a huge blessing to get to witness. But um, yeah, this weekend, I went up. And the first morning, he, the speaker, his name's Justin, he it's funny because he came up from Arizona into Antarctic weather for a camp that he was originally planning on not even being there for. So that was a blessing that he got to come. Uh, but yeah, his name was Pastor Justin. And the first morning, he gave a message about how sometimes as believers, we can go through the motions. And sometimes we just find our faith feeling almost mundane or normal. And that got under my skin because I realized that was me. The last few times I've helped with youth group or led worship or anything, I realized my heart wasn't in it. And that hurt. That doesn't feel good. And so even like Easton and any of the other boys I hung out with that day will tell you I was kind of crabby all day because of that. But that evening he gave a message and it was about remember who you are. And he went down this whole list of when you are struggling with fear, remember who you are. When you're struggling with depression, when you feel the weight of something on you, remember who you are. And he went down this list and he finished with remember whose you are. And when he said that, I felt this feeling that I can only compare to the day I was baptized. And then um, he called for anyone who was a new believer to come up to the front. And in that moment, I had this attitude of, you know, five, six kids get, you know, give their life to Jesus. I see it all the time, nothing, nothing new. 32 kids stood up and went to the front of that room. And I had this moment of realizing that this is my life's mission happening before my eyes. And this is the first crazy part. I don't remember standing up. I don't remember moving. But I opened my eyes. I was on the opposite side of the gym from where I was sitting before, praying with new believers I had never met. And I went and prayed over as many of these kids as I could. And then as they went back into a time of worship after this, as I was walking back to my seat, I felt that God was right there with me in a way he never was before. And he said two things to me. The first thing that he said was that he was proud of me and excited for what was about to happen. And the second thing he said was that I needed to go talk to this speaker, Pastor Justin, afterwards. I didn't know why. I just knew I needed to. And so after this whole time of worship, as everyone else broke off into small groups, me and my friend Elijah went and found this guy, Pastor Justin. And as we talked to him, the first thing he did was he told us about a cool ministry for church kids. It's, like a, it's almost like a social media site for church kids. It's a cool ministry. But then we got to pray with him, and that was really cool. But then as a, almost an afterthought, after the conversation, I was getting ready to walk away, and he turns around one last time, and he says, you know God's calling you to ministry, right? And in that moment, I was like, whoa, really? Like, that's crazy. And then the next night was the night everyone got baptized, which the exact number of people was 26. 26 kids they baptized. 
But um, after some of the first baptisms, I went out and prayed with some of these middle school boys that got baptized up there. And at that moment, the their joy, their excitement over their faith just resonated with me in a way that nothing else has in a long time. And while I was praying over them, I have felt God in just a way I never have before, and he spoke to me just as clear as before and said that my calling is to be a youth pastor. And so, thank you. Yeah, I went up this weekend expecting to, you know, get to minister to the middle school boys, which I did get to do. I had to have some cool conversations. What I was not expecting was a pastor from Arizona I'd never met uh, to flip my whole life upside down. So that was just really cool. So I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Easton now, who is really quick. I just got to give some background on Easton. He's a really cool kid. I remember seeing one of the first times he ever came to youth group. And then after that, I swear, like, every week it seems like he's got two or three new people coming in with him, and it's crazy. I don't even understand where he finds this many kids. <laughs> but yeah, Easton's just a really cool guy, so here you guys go. Thank you. Hola, I'm Easton, and <laughs> if you don't know me, wait. <laughs> My mom's name is Kim Vindiola, and she works at the Silversmith. So, yeah, Winter Blast was a really cool thing where a lot of kids got to connect with God, and God present was really strong there. I mean, a lot of my friends were probably emotional about it. Not me, though, because, yeah, I'm just here. Yeah. So, God's present was there, and when, so, like he said, Justin called everybody up, and he was like, if you're struggling, get down on your knees now and br uh, pray, pray. And that's what I, I went up there, and a lot of kids did. I expected to open my eyes and only see about six kids, like, um... Patrick said, and, but there's 30 plus more, and that shocked me really badly because I didn't think there's going to be that many kids up there. So when I saw that, except after I got off my knees, stopped praying and stuff, I started praying with other people. And there's this one girl I met, and she was super nice, and I prayed over her because she, she had a couple cracks. Like, the theme was cracked, and I think that was a pretty cool theme because it shows that we all have our cracks. We're not all perfect because God made us how we are. So... Pretty much, I think a year ago, that's how long I've been going to youth group now. Uh, I was at school chilling, and Miss teachers walked up to me. and was like, hey, do you want to go to youth group? And I'm like, sure. First time I ever went, I skipped it. I stayed home. <laughs> didn't want to go. I was like, oh, okay, I don't care. Didn't care about this stuff. I didn't know about it. I didn't care about it. So then, the second time, my mom was like, I think you're going to go give it a try. And I was like, okay. So I went there, and I asked a lot of questions. I mean, a lot. I was like, so what about this? What about that? Yeah, Easton, be quiet. I understand, I understand. I know, I know. <laughs> so then a couple months go by, and I'm like, it makes more sense now. So then I start understanding it. So then I try to invite one more of my friends. So then more come. And then it's now summer, and I got invited to go to Christian camp. And I go, and it makes so much sense now. Like, I understand why God is calling everybody. I understand why God's talking to us. And it makes perfect sense. So then I said, I want to take this more serious. I want to start reading. I want to make a Bible verse wall. I want to make a prayer wall. Can I have a prayer over everybody that is struggling? So then I start doing that. And then I was going to get baptized this summer. But then God had other plans for me. He talked to me. He was like, get baptized at that camp. So then I was like, that sounds like a good idea. So then we got baptized. But that's not it. I invited my friends. I was able to help my friends accept their Lord and Savior, Jesus. They were able to help fight their fears and stuff, help get past their trauma and everything. Wait, brain loss. Okay, we got it back, we got it. And <laughs> God still has a calling for everybody. Some of you might just be here because my sister's here because she says that she's only here for me to speak. I don't think so. I think God's calling her. You guys might be here because your wife wanted to go or husband. Maybe you wanted to be here for your friends. I don't think so. God has more plans with all of you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. You know, sometimes hearing the examples of it, you see what expansion and conquest looks like, what it means. God has been at work destroying enemies. 
And now we have a bunch more brothers and sisters right here in this room. His kingdom is upside down. It's not what we would expect. Man, to be, how many people came here this morning expecting to be ministered to by, by youth, right? Man, his upside down kingdom. We're going to pray together to, to close out this service, but I would just encourage you, Paul's example, I am the worst of sinners. Christ died for me. He transformed me. He can do the same in your life too. Let's pray. So Father, we just, uh, man, we celebrate the work that you're doing. It is incredible. It's powerful. It turns the world upside down. You know, you reveal, Jesus, that (laughs) you've got plans. You've got things going on. And your kingdom is (laughs) not outnumbered. It's in a target-rich environment. I pray that you would be working in our lives. Help us to recognize that you came to rescue us. You came to use and and choose us. You came to send us to be a part of that kingdom as well. Help us to lean into you in this week ahead to see where you're leading, the ways that you want to work. In Jesus' name, amen.